Thank you, Ernst Robert. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Councillor Darren Sanders. I'm a, a Liberal Democrat councillor for Baffins, North Milton and South Copner. I'm also the Cabinet Member for Housing and Preventing Homelessness. Um, we're in the Guildhall Council Chamber, so please be assured that we've put appropriate cleansing and social distancing measures in place you know, to ensure that this meeting is undertaken in a COVID-secure manner. This has included a request for all attendees to have taken an LFD, that's a lateral flow test, within 48 hours of the meeting, the use of the NHS track and trace app or attend log, two meter social distancing, the wearing of masks when not seated, and a one way system in the Guild Hall. Limited public seating has also been made available, however, this meeting is also being webcast, hello, um, to allow the public to attend remotely if they so wish. Please be advised the public seating area is not in view of the camera used to webcast this meeting. Uh, can I please ask everyone here to remain seated throughout the duration of the meeting unless the toilet is really, really important, um, and to wear your face covering unless seated. Um, uh, I have to do a bit of housekeeping, uh, which is if the continuous fire alarm sounds, please leave. Um, please leave by the stairwells, don't use the lifts. Please assemble at Queen Victoria statue in front of the civic offices. In order to apply with, comply with the fire marshal regulations of the Guildhall Trust who own the building we're in, anyone who signed in at the Guildhall reception desk should sign out when leaving the building at the end of today's meeting. Um, as I said, as I indicated earlier, uh, this meeting is live streamed. Everyone speaking via a microphone will be on camera, including those making deputations. Uh, members of the press and public are also permitted to record the meeting on the, on, the, on, the, on the understanding that neither disrupts anything nor records those stating explicitly they do not wish to be recorded. If you don't wish to be recorded, please yell. Please, can everyone use the microphones and remember to switch them off when they have finished. So that is the uh, the housekeeping stuff. Um, just for everyone's purposes, I'll just introduce everybody and I should go right to the left. Um, Anna. Anna Martin, local democracy officer. Excellent. Kirsty. Yes, please. Um, Councillor Kirsty Mellor for Charles Dickens Ward. Okay. When I've done the introductions, because Councillor Mellor has actually never been in this chamber as an elected councillor before, um, I will I will run through various things, uh, if that's all right, just so we're all feeling inclusive. Young Wayne. I'm Wayne Layton. I'm a finance manager here at Portson City Council. Excellent. All right. Cal? Cal Corkery, councillor for Charles Dickens Ward and opposition spokesperson for housing. Thank you. Jo? Jo Bennett, head of business growth, play and youth. Okay. Scott? Scott Peter Harris, the councillor for Hillsey Ward and the conservative spokesperson for housing and preventing homelessness. Thank you very much. And finally, Maria. Maria Cole, representing the Residents Consortium. Okay, that's excellent. So, um, primarily for Council of Members' benefits and anybody who's not actually watched any of these meetings on a webcast, um, essentially this meeting is such whereby I'm the executive in charge, so ultimately it's my decision and it's my gaffe and it's my roles, allegedly. But what we try and do is be a bit more open and a bit more inclusive than that. So we do run through the, the business of the meeting. Uh, we t I tend to call people by their first names. I get called everything, so I don't mind particularly. Um, but what I usually do is I usually would ask for, uh, I'd ask the officer to speak first, who in this case would be Joe, who's overseeing this project, then any deputations who would be you, Kirsty, then I would go to Maria as representing the Residents Consortium, and then either Scott or Cal in any order, but going through both of them, and then I'll try and sum up at the end. That's right. That, this isn't necessarily how it works with everyone, but it's just trying to be as inclusive as possible, if that's all right. Um, so, we have um, various items here. We have apologies for absence. The only two people actually meant, three people who meant to apologise are me, Cal and Scott. So therefore, no, we don't have any. Um, Cal or Scott, do you have anything interesting to declare? No. Um, the only thing which I have, which is just more for transparency than anything else, is that people have come to me in the past about shoot pool, in particular shoot pool building, wanting to leave. Um, however, that is not something that affects any decision that I may or may not take uh, today. Um, so that's fine. So we have one item here, which is the acquisition of Viking Court and shoot pool. Joe. 
Thank you, Councillor Sanders. Um, the report today, then, as you say, is the acquisition of Viking Court and Sheep Pool. Um, the purpose of the report is to seek approval from yourself to acquire the buildings known as Viking and Sheep Pool to provide 24 units of accommodation. We're also seeking approval of a capital spend of £3.25 million to acquire and refurbish the 24 units and for these units to be held in the HRA housing revenue account. Um, the recommendations are that the Cabinet Member for Housing and Preventing Homelessness approve housing revenue account capital expenditure of £3.25 million to deliver 24 units of accommodation. Uh, the report recommends um, that the Cabinet Member delegate authority to the Director of Housing, Neighbourhood and Building in consultation with the Director of Finance and Resources to agree the use of either grant funding or one-for-one -one receipts to support this acquisition. Um, and also to apply for any grant funding to support this acquisition that may be needed. Um, and then that the Cabinet Member delegates authority to the Director of Housing, Neighbourhoods and Building Services in consultation with the City Solicitor to enter into any contracts and grant agreements as are needed to support the acquisition. For background, um, Viking Court was built in approximately 2004 and is situated in Arundel Street. The location and pictures of the properties are shown in Annex A. Um, the building um, is a three to four storey block of flats comprising 12 two bedroom flats and two one bedroom flats and there's a bike store on the ground floor. Um, Sheep Pool was built in approximately 2001 um, and is situated in Fratton Road. The location again is in Appendix A. Um, Sheep Pool is 10 one bedroom flats with a detached cycle store um, located in the southwest corner of the garden. Viking and Sheepool are owned by private individuals trading as a property company. Um, the properties are currently leased from the property company to Vivid Housing Limited um, and the lease ran um, for 36 months from the 1st of May 18 and expired on the 30th of April 21. Officers have been told by the agents acting for the property company that the disposal of the property by them relates to retirement planning um, and the agent has also confirmed that the existing parties, being the property company and Vivid, um, have failed to reach terms um, and accordingly have um, approached the council. Negotiation and an agreement on terms has been reached between the property company and Portsmouth City Council. Um, the original properties were built without Homes England grant funding and accordingly there's no requirement for the properties to remain as affordable housing. Therefore, sale of the units on the open market rather than to a social landlord would see a reduction in the city's affordable housing numbers. There are a number of acquisition considerations, including issues relating to the current occupiers, building conditions and the time frame, which I'd like to go through with you. Um, firstly, uh, and possibly most importantly, the current occupiers. Um, the lease between the owners of the property and Vivid requires that a six-month notice is issued by the owners to Vivid. Um, and the intention of the owners is to provide the notice on exchange of contracts with the council. So on approval of, the, of this transaction, um, officers will work with their counterparts at Vivid to discuss the options for this property um, and the housing of those living in the property um, in the event that the residents are unable to source alternative accommodation independently and require support from housing needs and advice, um, they will be dealt with in the usual way. Um, the Homeless Reduction Act obviously places a duty on local authorities to relieve homelessness and reasonable steps must be taken to help an applicant secure accommodation. There's also obviously the duty to assess whether or not PCC have a main housing duty. Um, the building condition then, um, initial survey works have taken place to understand the building condition and the initial cost estimates that this budget is set on uh, are based on these inspections. The cost of the refurbishment works have been reflected in the property valuations and the acquisitions costs have been noted, have been negotiated to allow for this. The Viking survey identified a number of building works as being necessary. And these include lift replacement, defective rainwater goods and repair of the associated elevations, replacement of inoperable and defective windows, replacement of the flat entrance fire doors. Um, there are some condensation issues that need to be addressed. There are kitchen and bathroom repairs and there's an electrical upgrade and testing needed. 
the shoot pool survey noted asphalt roof coverings to the flat roof terrace were being required as well as rainwater gutters and uh, hoppers overflowing the external communal doors and frames required replacement there was mold affecting the plaster in the flats and there's water penetration around the windows and from a flat roof there's also electrical installations to the communal area that require work I have included in the report um, some floor plans so that you can see the units of the properties and these are at B, C and D um, and each block has as I think I mentioned earlier a purpose built cycle store there are no issues with the layout or construction of the building um, that bring me to have concern regarding future building management there are of course though further survey works and detailed investigations to take place before the total sum and works for the refurbishment are understood these works will be carried out by our in-house building services team and the building services team will also review the energy use of the building and will seek to improve the building's energy efficiency if it is practical to do so and this could include the use of renewable technologies the budget for the acquisition refurb and all of the associated fees is 3.25 million uh, finally the timeline obviously I've mentioned previously the notice period and therefore the completion of the acquisition is likely to be approximately May 2022 but could be later um, the reasons for the recommendations are that these units currently provide affordable homes within Portsmouth and through this acquisition we can ensure that these units remain as affordable homes the acquisition will also increase the overall number of homes owned and managed by Portsmouth City Council that are held within the housing revenue account and these properties are very flexible so on inspection they are able to be used in a number of different ways by the council and they would be suitable for general needs accommodation supported accommodation and temporary accommodation and they therefore form a sound long-term investment for the council also from them um, and this is from a lifetime cycle point of view they are relatively young so I told you the construction dates so that you could see the age of those properties the our existing housing stock um, was built you know 40 50 years ago most of it and so these dwellings are newer than that um, I think probably in summing up I will pass to my finance colleague in a moment but I think the key here is that this report comes at a point in this transaction where we require approval to be able to move forward um, usually when I come to you with a report I'm able to answer all of your detailed questions about the future of the building and the tenants that live in it and at this point until we're able to move forward in this transaction I can't actually answer those in detail what I have been able to do is to um, say what we'll be doing next and who we'll be talking with and consulting with. Um, I'll pass now to my finance colleague for his finance comments. You haven't left me much more to say, really. Um, the finance comments um, obviously say that we're going to um, finance this through a mixture of unsupported borrowing and one-for-one -one receipts, and we're also going to be applying for affordable homes grant. Um, in order to fund it um, we've financially appraised it taking into account the borrowing costs maintenance and then the likely rent that we'll get in um, and we're um, content that this will have a positive effect on the HRA's 30-year business plan um, the, the report doesn't break down um, the capital sum of 3.25 million um, because some of that information is commercially sensitive but it was obviously shared with um, the portfolio holder and the opposition spokesman at the briefing a couple of weeks ago and that's all I have to say thank you for that Wayne and thank you for that Joe um, Kirsty normally there's a limit of six minutes in speaking the, these things don't worry about that uh, as you're the only person here it's definitely not six minutes uh, that's, that's what we'd like to hear that's excellent far away so thank you for allowing me to attend this meeting today and Joe thank you for meeting with Councillor Corky and myself a couple of weeks ago to discuss this issue so uh, one in three households in England have at least one major housing problem often related to overcrowding affordability or poor quality housing with these problems significantly affecting residents in Portsmouth one of the ways to manage the city's housing crisis is to significantly increase the supply of affordable homes and to buy back previous council properties. Thatcher's right to buy policy that helped people to buy their council homes plays an enormous contribution to the current housing crisis with the poorest people in our city who are paying the price for her damaging policy. 
Housing issues such as these affect a person's life and lead to poorer health outcomes. The direct impact on physical health and mental health stems from poor quality homes, affordability and insecure housing. Housing continues to be one of the most common advice areas in Charles Dickens ward and is often part of the wider difficulty that comes with trying to budget on a low income, living in poverty or having your physical and mental health affected by the behaviour of bad neighbours, dreadful letting agencies or rogue landlords. Council Corkery and I have been engaging with the residents of Viking Court for some time. They have consistently reported poor living conditions, including damp and old heating systems, poor maintenance and poor communication, and an inadequate response time from the Housing Association around repairs to the property. We have also shared the experience of difficulty in communication with the Housing Association. We were also concerned by the instability the short hold tenancy offered by Vivid Homes caused residents. It was never made clear to the residents what the plan would be when their lease came to an end. All of these issues have contributed to the detriment of the residents. Decent housing is a fundamental human right. We are supportive of Portsmouth City Council purchasing these properties and will be working with our residents to ensure that the process and change of ownership will result in minimal disruption and that residents are consulted throughout. As it's currently unclear what will happen to the residents that live in these properties, we ask that the Cabinet Member for Housing works with us, the Ward Councillors and the residents to ensure that the tenants are at the core of this purchase. Thank you. Thank you for that, Kirsty. That's very kind of you. Um, I'll come back to some of those points, if I may, when I, when I sum up, but that's really kind of you. Thank you very much indeed. Maria. Um, first of all, can I apologise? I've not gone through the paperwork like I normally do. I can't find my highlighter pens because I moved on Wednesday. Um, but I only have actually two questions, really. Um, the flats, when they're ready for May next year, are they going to be primarily for people on the waiting list, or would it also include people perhaps upsizing from one to two bedroom? That's the first question. So the key here, Maria, is that the properties are currently occupied, so right. they have residents living in them. And so um, what I need to do next, provided that the transaction is approved, is to speak to Vivid, who are their landlord, right. and then we need to talk to those residents and we need to find out what they need from us and what they need from their landlord. And then we'll be able to work out the end solution here and what we're looking for. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the other one, it, it might be a bit of a silly question but I've not heard of the council of the acquisition what's the difference then between acquisition and CPO so we're just buying this that's what acquisition means we're just buying it um, like you buy any house in the private market and a compulsory purchase order is different it's a compulsory situation this is where we've voluntarily uh, been offered something and we've agreed terms with the owner so that we can buy it and there are no silly questions. I can vouch there is never a silly question. It's absolutely important. Thank you for that, Maria. Scott. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Sanders. Um, just a quick question. It's just something I, I've read online, and I don't know if you can indulge me, because there seems to be a belief that if we were building these properties, they, won't be, they would be of a bigger spatial standard. Um, is that true? Thank you, Councillor Pate Harris. Um, so, Portsmouth City Council, when we build, uh, build to higher than standard space standards anyway. So, the answer to your question is yes, were I building them, they would be larger. They are, however, adequate housing, and in an acquisition situation, they are adequate for what's needed. You'll have noticed in the report that I referenced that on inspection, there were no issues in the construction that led me to believe there would be management issues with the property. No, it's, it's fine. I just thought I'd best ask the question because it's, it's something that, you know, you get your um, politicos online saying that if PCC were building these, they, they wouldn't be building to these standards. Obviously, it's okay for them to buy them, which actually I generally don't have a problem with the purchase in, in general, as we've already discussed. Um, the six-month notice issue. So, obviously, like you said about conventional buying and buying and selling a house, which is the pain I'm going through at the moment. Um, the exchange of contracts, which is obviously an exchange period, but then you have the sale completion, which is further on down the line. Um, when do you ex 
expect to exchange contracts because that's that's key to obviously giving notice um, from the current owner to Vivid and obviously that's key for us to obviously be able to do what we want to do. So the exchange of contracts is obviously um, related and reliant on this decision today. So um, we'll be hoping to move forward shortly. I obviously have held back from agreeing final terms because I need to do a little bit more work, but we are at the stage in the process where we are ready to be discussing an exchange date. And as you state, there, then there will be a six-month gap, which is unusual, but not in a commercial property situation. No, it's, it's, it's quite... Quite um, normal, Joe. I think, to be honest, um, I think what I'm getting at is, can we find out when that is done? I think for myself and Councillor Corku, so we know when there is a timeline for the residents that are living there. More so for my colleagues over here, because obviously they are the ward councillors, so they're going to want to have that information if they need to discuss anything. And um, just moving on as well, um, I just want to look at the. I don't want to name the overall price and go into the details of the numbers, but I think we, we are in a volatile marketplace at the moment, and it's only because I reference something that's actually in a governance and audit report, which I think is quite key about challenges within the directorate, and it's obviously talking about material supply and cost in an increase in shortages. Um, so obviously I know that there are going to be some shortages and there is a significant increase. What contingency has been built into the actual overall figure? And I'm looking at you, Wayne, for that one, because I think there must be some sort of contingency built in. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind, I'll step in. Um, so there has been a contingency built in, not only as a standard project contingency, but also a percentage contingency on the refurbishment price. Very happy to share that information with uh, members offline. Um, because obviously to talk about it in detail would be to share the remainder of the breakdown of costs. Yeah, I, I don't want to get into that. I mean, I've just done some rough numbers about what the contingency and what the percentage increase potentially could be. I, I would be interested, I think Councillor Cork would be interested to see what actually is in the background on that figure because it could actually be quite lower than what we're actually agreeing to today when the overall project's finished. And I think it's always good to get value for money. Um, Homes England grant, I think that's important as well. How far along are we, obviously, after we, whatever we agree today? So the key here is to have agreement to the transaction. If we have agreement to the transaction, we can then uh, prepare the remainder of the deal. And at that point, we would understand what we would and wouldn't be eligible for with Homes England. And accordingly, you'll have noticed that the report references both the possibility of one for one and of grant, because as we move forward, we'll ascertain which provides the better value and which we wish to be progressing. OK, I think it would be a nice uh, Carol. Sorry, I was just going to say, and also, we can't have a conversation with Homes England until this decision has been made. I think it would be quite interesting, because obviously the numbers predicate on what Homes England do and what Homes England don't. I think it's interesting for us as cabinet, I mean, I, I don't know if you don't mind me speaking for you, Councillor Corkery, but I think we'd be interested to know how much Homes England grant we're getting, because obviously the rest is going to be provided from one for one or one for sport of borrowing. So it's a quite different transaction, isn't it, um, whether you get the grant or whether you don't get the grant. So, I mean, I'm broadly in support of it, but I'd like to see the devil in the detail um, on that, and I think it's something that you could possibly bring back here at a later date, if that's okay with you, Councillor Sanders. Um, I think that we are very happy always to share the transactions and the bids that we are progressing with Homes England, and as you know, in your briefings, we keep you abreast of where we are with those um, applications and also when we're successful we let you know what's happening there so very happy to consult and share the information as we usually do well, that's perfect then um, it's just more so that I know what me and Wayne have had discussions about different projects where we look at it and we say what well, this is how much it's going to cost with a Homes England grant this is how much it's going to cost without the grant this is going to cost them predicated on this but I think it'd just be handy on this one after the decision that I think effectively that you're probably going to make today. It would be stupid if you didn't and to bring it here and not do it. Um, so I'd just be interested if you could do that breakdown again um, for me and for Council Corkery as well, just so we can see what it is, because it does make a difference whether it's going to be unsupported borrowing or not. Were those all your questions, Scott? I think so. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, we'll know. yell if there's anything yeah, else. Yeah, it depends what Councillor Corkery well, says. I don't, I don't know why just on something. Well, we, we lost Cal. Thank you, Darren. Um, could I start off just by asking if we have any update, as far as we're aware, from the engagement that's happened between Vivids and the existing tenants? I don't. Joe? No, I don't. Okay. Uh, apologies, sir. So, this is for people who are watching. Uh, we, after the, the, an initial discussion between Councillor Corkery, Councillor Peter Harris, and me, 
um, I liaised with Joe to, to ensure that there is good communication as the council has been doing, for instance, around the Horatio and Leamington House redevelopments with the people who were in here because I think we all felt that the last thing we needed was the first thing that they knew that the council may be taking over their homes was reading about it in the paper, uh, which seems to me the last thing. But I'm, I don't know, Cal. Uh, I've, I've asked Joe, but um, um, I've... Um, no. So that's a ridiculously straight answer, which politicians aren't supposed to give, but no. Okay. I mean, it just seems to me, I know that um, Councillor Mellor touched on it also, it seems to me that's quite a key issue at, at this stage of the proposal in terms of the, the residents' awareness of what's going on, because clearly there's going to potentially be anxiety and uncertainty about their future and their, their accommodation. Um, so hopefully that's something we can kind of all work together to, to follow up and ensure that people are as in the loop um, as possible so that there's not any unnecessary uncertainty. I think in general I'm supportive of this. Um, as has been discussed earlier, we've picked up a number of casework issues, particularly from Viking Court over the past year or two, that we've then um, followed up with the council and also with Vivid as, as the housing association. It seems to me in general a lot of the issues revolve around Vivid's relationship with the building owner. So this kind of private leasing arrangement where Vivid takes a private property, leases it from a landlord and then uses it for social housing, clearly that's beneficial in that it increases the kind of short term um, availability of social housing. But there have been particular issues I know with this blog and I think it's probably a more general issue with that kind of relationship in terms of the repairs and maintenance of those blocks. So we know and we've raised issues with Vivid about ongoing maintenance to the block. There's quite often been the pushback, well we would like to do this work, however the landlords won't sign it off, they won't fund the, rep the, the repairs that are needed. Um, so I think bringing it into council ownership clearly will, will address that problem because it means that the council then has direct power over the repairs and maintenance um, of those blocks, so that's good. But I think there's, there's obviously a general issue with that private leasing arrangement that it may be worth reviewing across the city because there are other blocks where it's also pertinent and, and may need to be reviewed. I think that was the kind of general point I wanted to make. Obviously, I've emphasised the, the importance, I think, of engaging with tenants and ensure that they're um, kept abreast of what's going on and given as much assurance as possible about their future. Clearly, no one wants to see a situation where people potentially end up not having somewhere to live or currently got somewhere to live. Um, and certainly, I don't think that would be acceptable from the Council's perspective. Um, so hopefully, there's agreement within this room that we can all do um, everything within our power to ensure that's not the case. Um, thank you for that, Cal. Um, if I may make a few observations. Um, I think, Kirsty, your point about putting tenants at the heart of the process is absolutely essential. And, and just again, for people who may not have read the report and are watching this on the webcast, if we didn't do this, 24 families would be frankly on the streets, um, or they would be turning up to the building opposite us today, homeless. That is not acceptable, frankly. Um, both of you have been kind enough to, to, to share with me your frustrations about things not happening. Um, and I agree with Cal that the, the relationship is interesting, and that's being diplomatic, I think, about it all. Uh, and I hope that we'll have a more comprehensive relationship going forwards. I think engagement with tenants is absolutely crucial. And one of the problems we have here is that it needs a decision in public in order to finish a negotiation process and actually get into the real detailed stuff that both of you and, and Scott as well um, have raised today. Um, and I'm certainly very keen that the people living there get a permanent home. Um, I, I recognise that um, there may need to be some building work happening uh, and we can have a gentle discussion earlier as to why it hasn't happened years ago. Uh, but I'm sure that's a discussion for later. Um, but I think it is important that tenants actually get that reassurance. Uh, and that's one of the things that we can discuss with both the, the landlord and, and, and with Vivid uh, as well. As far as um, Scott's points about uh, bringing, bringing stuff forwards, we've been da frankly, we have been dancing around various things today. Um, we've had more detailed offline discussions. Uh, Scott, Cal and I have had more detailed offline discussions about the figures. But if we did the figures in detail, frankly, we'd have to stop this being in public and the, the, 
webcast would have to be switched off, which is not fair, because I think it's right that people be as transparent as possible. Um, but certainly, with reg I'm, I'm more than happy for that information, Scott, to be shared at least with the three of us, recognising that it may be a bit sensitive. I don't want sensitive information if finding its way on Facebook the following day, uh, because I don't think that's fair, not least on the tenants, actually. Um, but I'm sure we'll be able to share that, and if necessary, and if we can bring it back in public, we will. But we'll at least share it amongst the three of us because that's the right thing to do. Um, but um, as Scott may have indicated, I think this is a really good idea. Um, as I said, the alternative is 24 families on the streets. Uh, personally, I think once the council takes over the place, for whatever purpose we wind up doing with whatever is most effective, both for the tenants, for the people, for, sorry, they're not tenants, they're human beings, for the humans who live there and for the humans across the city, the most important thing is we take some form of control of this place and make it a bit better. Um, and that's the most important thing. Um, and that's why I'm delighted that we're able to, I'm certainly happy to approve it today. Um, like Scott, I had also picked up what some private landlords had said online. Um, and uh, I'm delighted that Joe beat me to it, uh, frankly. Uh, but I think it's fair that we have that open discussion. And on that basis, I'm delighted that we can continue the negotiations. And again, on the basis that we do what is right for people living there and for people in the city. And here endeth the homily. And actually, here endeth the meeting. So, um, Anna, the meeting is closed at four minutes past five. Um, and now we can switch off the webcast, uh, if that is all right. Uh, and thank you to the Mast Hordes uh, for watching this afternoon.